Chapter 4 Hunters and Hunted The Chronicles tell little more of that river journey till its end, though it lasted many days more, and bore them some hundred and fifty leagues at least into the heart of the forest. Rapid and shallow they passed with no desperate troubles, for their rafts were strong and stable, and brought them through where fleeter boats might have been lost. Their journey was swift, for now they seldom cared to moor, but sailed on throughout the nights as long as they had a glimmer of light to steer by. Only when moon and stars failed them were they driven to seek the land in the hours of darkness, and there they slept on the rafts, close together, with a strong watch set. But although for that time the travelers were assailed no more, care still lay heavy on their hearts. "'Wonder if all those lost folk didn't just starve,' grumbled Rock. "'Who'd be hunger's the worst terror in this land?' "'Terror enough for me,' muttered Burr, eyeing the dwindling hummock under the awning. They were on half rations now, which must soon grow less. Kermorvan had intended that they live by hunting, such supplies as they carried serving chiefly to tide them over and provide them some healthy variety. All the company could hunt, some with great skill, not least himself. But save for a few fish, even they had caught nothing. It was not that Iathan was empty of beasts. By day and by night, they could be heard at a distance, living their lives among the trees, part of the vast cycle of growth and life that was the greater life of the forest. But save for those first few deer, no living animal had shown itself. For two whole days, the huntsmen had lain in wait by the bank, at what they all agreed was a well-frequented drinking place. They had chosen their hides well, disturbed little, and covered track and scent with consummate skill. Yet, not so much as a sound of a living beast did they catch. But even as they took to the rafts again, angry and dejected, pinched with hunger, the murmur of the forest reawoke around them as vigorous as before. Small bluebirds chased one another here and there, and a high wickering screech sounded mockingly from the bushes. It's not canny, grumbled Borhe. All them beasts staring clear of us. Not natural like. Evil. How do you know what's natural and what's not? grunted Cassie. He and Borhe were sitting dawn watch on the first raft, leaning against the steering oar. He spoke softly but so still was the brightening air that Elof heard him clearly, lying half awake in the boughs of the raft behind. Evil dreams had hounded him from sleep. I know these great woodlands, me, rasped the huntsman. I've walked in Aethenic. Remember? I know. They're not the piddling little woods these Nordney oafs are used to or our high and mighty young lordling. You can't just go a-stroll in these glades and expect to make free of the hunting. There's a good many others dwell here. You've got to get the word from one of them, see? With their hand against us, our luck's turned, and no game will come near us. For he sounded very uneasy. Elof could hear him twisting this way and that on the logs scanning the inscrutable trees. Mood's word. How? What do you tell me? That you know some evil's a brew? Something, I. But why evil? Not evil to demand your due, is it? There's a Helgo Ryan, now. The hunt. You want luck in the chase. Stands to reason it's their leave you must ask. Get a good word set upon your weapons. You mean... There's other men here? Asked Borhe dubiously. Cassie tapped his nose wisely with a finger. Ah, I didn't say that, mind. There's some. 
but you don't want no truck with them. But the hunt, there, natural forces, no more. Not to fear, long as you know the right ways, sound ways, old ways. I had them from my granddad, he from his uncle, and so on down a long line. Great hunters, all who never lacked kill and keep. He darted a look back over his shoulder at Elof, who kept his breathing slow and did not stir. Listen, you're a bright lad. Want to bring yourself a spot of hunting luck? Tell you some, tell you a thing you could try. It's simple enough. Do you take two good arrows, another that's already struck its mark, catch you a bird or some other beast alive, large or small, no matter long as it has eyes. Then at moonrise, stand in a tall tree's shadow and lay the arrows crosswise. Take your catch and a third arrow in hand and speak a hunter's blessing thus. He began to chant softly. Watchers that in darkness wake, guardians of the shadow break. What be offered, hunters, take. On this sign I bid you slake. Thirst for... That's a ill sound for a blessing, or he broke in uneasily. Ah, don't be such a damned waybelly, gr grunted Cassie. Just trying to help a fellow Southern, aren't I? With these Nordney louts ready to spit on us, and my fine lordling, he just encourages them. One in the eye for that lot of them, it'd be if... Enough, Cassie. The bark of Kermorvan's voice startled even Elof. He whom they had thought asleep was up and on his feet in a single movement, glaring down at the huntsman. I numbered you in our company only for your boasted experience. And of that, the more I hear, the less I like. I know you for a grumbler and a superstitious fool. Take great care I do not come to think you something worse. Upon your peril, Cassie. The huntsman growled, spat some word, and himself surged to his feet slipping on the uneven logs. Comes to that, my dear young lordy. I've about had my belly full of you. And you, bore he. You'll suffer this pup to kick our faces, who rates his own folk lower than a tinker and a duergar bitch. Elof scrambled up, hand on sword, ready, if need be, to jump the gap. Cassie's hand rested too near his knife. Heads lifted from blankets, came awake in a flurry of movement, believing it was some new peril. But poor he only looked coldly up at the huntsman and spat into the stream. Do you fight your own fights, Cassie? And don't come running to me if you take a hiding, you and your mucky little hedge wizardry. What good's that to me? The blood drained from Cassie's face, and Elof saw a cold glitter grow in his narrowing eyes. Hedge wizardry, is it, my lad? Is it? He looked sulkily at Kermorvan, and the other travelers rising uncertainly. But stop you till you've starved enough under the boy's yoke. Then you'll all come and come begging me for my wisdom. On your knees. Elof gritted his teeth. The moment was ugly. Cassie strove to sow discontent, imperiling their unity and inevitably their lives. Yet he could hardly be slain for mere words. But then, facing forward as he was, Elof caught the flicker of movement among the trees ahead, and forgetting all else he hissed and pointed so fiercely that all eyes turned to follow. A prey, breathed Kermorvan. Geis, Cassie, to your bows! Anger forgotten, the huntsmen ducked to the weapons they kept at hand. 
Cassie yanked back the cord of his arbalist and dropped a coral into the channel. Geyser's hornbow was strung in one fluid action, and Kermorvan snatched a longbow and quiver from among the stores. Elof's fingers itched, though he had no love of the chase or the kill for its own sake. He was a fair shot with a bird bow, but knew these were the likeliest marksmen. The deadly barbs glinted as the archers notched and drew, seeking an aim in the uncertain light. The watchers quivered tense and taut as the bowstrings. At this gold, there might well be no second shot. But when they saw their mark clear, no arrows flew. With the rest of the hunters stared dumbfounded at the monstrous shape the grow the growing sunlight gilded among the leaves. Elof knew no beast like it, and neither, by their gasps, did the others. Ferris, is that a bear? whispered Rock. Then it could breakfast on any I've seen, hissed Ills. Even the great cavern dwellers. Slowly, almost painfully it seemed, the great beast lumbered down the bank. Its long, lank hair, reddish with a strange green cast, hung from limbs bowed but as thick about as a man's body. Abruptly, it reared up. All flinched, the bows jerked ready as it, as it rose on its haunches and spread its fast forelegs in menacing embrace. That's no bear, breathed Dills. It has a tail, see? And that long head? And by the shaper's grace, see the paws on it? Elof's mouth dried as he saw a single hooked claw unfold from each massive interned forepaw. Huge black sickles opened a hook and slash. Then, quite unconcernedly, it grasped the overhanging limb of a lidden and bent it down to its open mouth. A long red tongue unreeled to curl greedily about the heart-shaped leaves and the sweet flowers between, plucking them into the grip of the narrow horse-like jaw. The shift from menace to bovine placidity was almost humorous. Ill smothered a breathless giggle. But then... A single humming note sounded, the harp string plucked, and two arrows soared up over the shimmering water and plunged like bright beaked hawks upon their prey. The dead snap of the arbalist sounded, and the quarrel, flatter in its flight, hissed low and fast across the bank. They saw the broad back flinch at the first impact then stared as one arrow glanced across the rough hairs and vanished at a tangent among the leaves. And the others spun off into the bushes. The coral struck with the ringing bite of an axe in wood, hung a moment, and then fell slithering through the fur. With a high bleeding cry, the beast whirled about and went lumbering and crashing away through the undergrowth, still shrilling in panic. It's a demon, yelled Borhe, and threw himself flat upon the logs. Dills pulled him up by the tunic. Don't be a great fool. It must have a tough hide, that's all. Or even bone within the skin, like those little grassland creatures you have in the south. Elof snapped his fingers. At harness the forest folk wore. It might have been made from such a hide. We could land and go after it. Kermorvan stared after the disappearing beast and shook his head. We could only hope to slay it at course, close quarters. We mo might go far astray before corning such a brute. It moves fast enough now. And what then? Spear and blade against those sickle claws? on limbs that can bend a tree so lightly? Scarce worth the risk, I fear. But Cassie, he added, 
turning to the hunter. I see Borhi was bitten deeper than he allowed by your bogies. But can you explain why such a curse cannot stop us catching fish? When next you hold forth on Hedgecraft, do you also trail some fish lines? You may find the fish more gullible. Elof joined in the general laughter and was glad to see that Borhi did also. Cassie glared at the young Corsair a moment, then carefully laid down his arbalist and returned to his seat by the steering oar. But Borhi did not join him. Instead, he rummaged among the baggage for the fishing lines. Kermorvan and Guys unstrung their bows, and the others not on watch returned to their blankets to snatch what little sleep they could in the growing light. Elof stood for a moment, undecided, and then he caught Kermorvan's eye. The warrior nodded and sprang effortlessly across onto his raft. He looked around and spoke low. So, something still concerns you. Something worse than a diet of fish. I fared little better in the marshlands and was content. No, it is simply that, well... Field lore such as Cassie's is one sign of our decline. Scraps of true smithcraft debased, mean and slight, with power only to work petty ill. And that only for those who have a touch of the true craft in their blood. Kermorvan's eyes widened. And Cassie has? Why did you not tell me? I did not see it in his eye till now. It is not strong in him. It shows only in his anger. Nevertheless, it is there. Not to fear, only to be wary of. And I also find it strange that the whole life of this forest shuns us so thoroughly. Kermorvan nodded. Do you indeed? And have you considered that the cause might be more natural than bewitchment? Of course, but I cannot think what. The warrior smiled without mirth. Why, that is not us the beasts shun. We know that others hunt here. Might it not then be them the beasts fear? But why should such hunters always be near us? Oh. A sudden understanding grew in Evelof, and he raised his eyes to the forest above them. A shadow against brightening dawn. A lowering cliff face of trees. He realized then how much they had changed, day by day, as the company sailed by. Rare now were the redwoods of the coastlands, and rare all the great evergreens. Lindens stood high and shady among their ranks, the honey fragrance of their flowers drifting down to him, and massive sycamores. The solid masses of green and grayish-brown were broken by the bright lives of many maples and red oaks, and by silver birch trunks and blue-gray beeches. Yellow birch trees shone golden in the misty dawn against the somber black trunks of walnuts. Fair and rich was the canopy of the forest in the hues of early summer, but the fairest garments might conceal a blade. You mean, we are watched? Kermorvan nodded. I do, by those who normally hunt the forest beasts. They hide from us. But not from the beasts, because hunting is not their present purpose. So wherever we pass, they do also, and the beasts flee or fall silent in their lairs. And as to who they might be, these hunters, I believe you guess now as I do. The children, said Elof uneasily. Watchers who can travel among the trees, and so pace the rafts. But, why have you not told the others? Dare I? How will they behave if I tell them the trees may be full of unseen eyes? 
You and I and ills know they need not be hostile. But the others? The Corsairs especially, after what happened to Ermahal. I do not wish our hotheads loosing bolts at every bow that quivers. One strike might draw a rain of spears from the forest folk. Thus far they seem content only to watch. That is why I was so reluctant to let us stray far into the forest. It might be what they await. Elof was still scanning the trees, though he knew he need expect to see nothing. If we could evade them somehow... Aye, that would be different. But we cannot, for now. When we reach the lake, we may contrive a chance. Until then, do you keep silent about this? Save to ills, perhaps. Over the next day or so, even Elof grew weary of fish. In these lower, deeper stretches of the stream, the fish grew large, but the flavor of their flesh seemed muddier. The commonest catches were monstrous catfish of a kind not seen in the coastal rivers. Fierce fighters and often too heavy for one man to land unaided. The sight of their immense toad-like mouths, leering and barbell hung, as they snapped and thrashed at the line, was disturbing in itself. And since Kermorban still would not allow the company ashore, they had to await suitable islands to cook and smoke their catch. It meant that often they had to do without a hot meal after a difficult day's rafting, or dry clothes after rain. And there were many grumbles. But Elof was relieved that none sought to gainsay Kermorvan's word. He and Ills took care now to watch the trees in twilight and the dark. More than once they believed they spied foliage jerk and quiver as if some large creature swung between trees. And once, Ills was sure that she had seen a hand and a face emerge. Kermorvan was pleased. They do not guess we have good night eyes among us, then, and grow careless. Now we must seek and seize a moment when we can travel faster and further than they. If only we could come to that lake soon. He pounded the logs impatiently. If only. By all the accounts, it was indeed no very great time before their vo voyage met its unlooked-for end. It may even have been that same night. It is sure that the first wan warnings came while Elof still had his friend's words very much in mind. He was on night watch with Dervis and Tenvar when Rock hailed him from the first raft. A wide bend in the river was approaching, and they must stand ready with their poles lest the current swing them aground on land or sandbank. But as they probed cautiously for the depth, they felt the stream pluck at their poles. Eddies seek to twist them under the logs, and they heard the rush and chuckle of the water against the blunt boughs grow suddenly louder. There's no bottom with this pole, called Burr. Not even mud. Why, Amicac, the lad's right, muttered Dervis to Elof. It grows wider and deeper all of a sudden, and yet flows faster. Now what's that mean on a piddling little inland flood like this? Rapids? If only the skipper were here, he'd know. His lordship might, or the lass. Do you give her a shake? But then Rock hailed them again and pointed, and they knew some change must be near. They were rounding the curve now, swinging wide across the rushing waters, and the, for the first time in many long and weary nights, the dark trees no longer narrowed to nothingness ahead of them. Instead, a bright gap opened, widened as if the trees were curtains drawn slowly apart, layers of curtains and each thinner than the last. For through them, between the trees, 
shone glimmers of the same silvery light, ever broader and brighter. From out of a cloudy sky, the white moon blazed down upon an expanse of water wide and calm, silvering it like a mirror save where the wooded hills beyond cast their shadows. That single hail had aroused Kermorvan, and even as he bounced to his feet, he was calling the others. They too came suddenly awake at the sight of the breach in the walls they had come to hate. Some even whooped and pranced with delight on the uneven logs, till Kermorvan's hissed command called them to heal. Do you dream yet that you think us free of danger? Perhaps it only begins. All of you, gather up your gear and all the supplies you can carry. Be alert, be ready to abandon the rafts if need be, and spring or swim for shore. His sword flashed in the moonlight. If danger threatens, I will part the rafts. One may survive if the other is overset. He scooped up his own pack in a heavy food sack and turned to Elof, standing on the bow of the rear raft. Now, how fares the current? Faster still, and neither Dervis nor Ills can explain it. Nor I, muttered Kermorvan gazing about the widening channel. I did fear some hazard between us and that lake, at worst, falls or rapids. But I can see nothing to cause this strange current. Ills, what of your sight? She scrambled onto the oar mounting, one plump hand shielding her eyes from the moon. Elof steadied her as the raft surged anew beneath them. Little enough. A small turmoil in the water. Around slender things up thrust, like reeds or twigs. In water this deep? cried Kermorvan, and threw his weight upon the steering oar that thrummed now like a gale struck sail. Down, all of you. Hold as you can. There is some hidden barrier. And as the oar rose creaking from the water, he drew his sword and hewed down to the stern. The taut cords sang apart, and the first raft sprang forward as the glittering water opened out around them. Face down on the planks with pack and food sack on his back, frantically clutching the stout crosspiece under his chest, Elof felt the weight of the sodden logs lift and buck under him as if some immense hand took hold and hurled it like a javelin at the unknown target. And has not all my life been thus? In a moment of futile rebellion, he glared up at the sky beyond the treetops, whipping by, half expecting to see something there, for good or ill. But the stars blazed ice cold in blackness, remote, indifferent, bitterly alone. A sudden shout came from the raft ahead. Then, with a deep, grinding crunch, its bow heaved upward like a drawbridge and split. The scream and crackle of stressed wood dwarfed the petty voices of men. Spray rose and spattered him. He gritted his teeth, and then the shock shivered through him, shook and slammed him violently against the wood the rough bark scouring skin. The logs rolled and flexed under him. The stout bow that was the crosspiece writhed and twisted like a living serpent in his grip. Despite Kermorvan's swift action, the current crashed the second raft sideways against the first, driving it as a hammer on chisel against the unseen obstacle. The churning surface erupted, Mud and filth sprayed skyward, and a wave of creamy water washed over the second raft. Elof clutched wildly at his handhold as it dragged at him, and plucked and twisted at his pack. The river lurched forward, bucked, twisted crazily sideways and tilted, 
sweeping him across the logs at a wrist-wrenching angle. Mud spurted up between the logs and was whipped away into the foaming maelstrom. He heard Ills cry out, but could see neither her nor any other in the spray. Something lashed stinging across his face and clung. Then it seemed that the obstacle beneath the logs gave way, and the raft was shot forward, whirling about in the current. The looming trees fell away, the wheeling stars overhead slowed and steadied, the log beneath him settled and rode level. For a moment, he could only lie there gasping, the thing that had hit him a curtain of stinking slime across his eyes. He sought to brush it free and found his fingers entangled. He panicked and tore at it and grew more entangled. Then his fingers touched another's amid its tangles that pulled it away from his face. His heart leaped as he saw whose hand it was. Ill's, at least, was safe. He caught her hand and raised himself on one numbed elbow. There were the others, as dazed as he felt. Dervis and Tenbar still clung to the steering oar, spitting out water and weed. Arvis was covered in fragments of the ruined canopy. The raft was clear now, drifting out across the calm silver of the lake waters. A faint current seemed to be carrying them into a little bay ahead. Elof looked about urgently for the first raft, and found instead a loosening tangle of timbers astern, wheeling slowly in the current. A sorry sight. The collision had sheared off two logs, and by the look of it, the steering gear, and broken the forward cross members. But he could see figures picking themselves up and sliding swiftly along the logs, striving to make them secure. He scanned the water quickly for floating heads, found none, and glanced back to see what had so nearly destroyed them. The whole river mouth had changed. The water level had fallen, and was now even with the lake. A new strip of bank glistened with exposed clump of, clumps of weed. The barrier stood revealed now as a thick tangle of stick and bough. The double impact of the rafts had smashed a wide gap in it, through which a muddy torrent poured. A beaver's dam, gurgled Arvis. Biggest that I ever saw. I've heard they have giant beavers in the wilds of Nordney. Ills looked at him acidly and thrust out what she had taken from Elof's face. Do they use nets? The men gaped in horror. For net, it surely was, crudely woven of some coarse fiber. He stared again at the channel. On either side of the breach, the ragged edges of such a net straggled useless in the current. Then, amidst the heaving water, Elof saw a sudden arrowing swirl, and another. What's that? he demanded of Dervis. Amicac, how'd I know? Eddie's, most like. Well, they're nowhere near, though. Sooner we're off this pond, the better I'm suited. Elof nodded, shivering in his soaked clothes. At least we're not far away from the bay. The water should be shallower there. Only the others can hold on. He looked back, and worse than the night breeze chilled him. He cried out, pointed. The swirls had appeared again. Dark folds in the calmer water, streaking out against the current. It was the first raft they pursued. None there had heard. Elof struggled up on shaky legs, but even as he opened his mouth to shout, he saw the wrecked raft judder and halt abrupted, abruptly in its wheeling, and clambering silhouettes stagger and fall. Then, quite slowly as it seemed, its huge logs parted at the bow 
and spread out wide like the fingers of a giant hand. Helpless, Elof listened in horror to yells and screams, saw two tall figures bestride the logs, haul others out of the water, and then begin fastening cords and chains to the logs, meaning to secure them lest the raft break up altogether. But even as they leaped across to the outer logs, the water swirled again, and Elof glimpsed a curved bulk that arched up and vanished, the back as it seemed of some fair-sized creature, mottled or dappled like fish or seal, glistening under the moon. Then, with that same easy, deceptive slowness that was horrible to watch, the logs jarred and swung together again. The leapers landed, but skidded. One caught himself by the chain he bore and fell along the log, but the other missed his footing and slid down its flank into the water. He caught himself by a branch stump. The other flung himself forward, but even as their hands met, the huge logs bounced together. Beneath the dull boom, there was a single crunch. Cry cut short. When they bobbed apart again, one figure knelt there, staring down at nothing. Eyes done, cried Kermorvan's voice, and then Guise's. But there was no answer. Elof and the others stared in horror, forgetting for one instant too long that they also might be in peril. A cry from behind was their warning. Whirling about, Elof caught the black sword from its scabbard and threw himself slithering down the logs. Dervis clung still to the steering oar, but frantically now, for both legs trailed in the water as if some great weight hung from them. Elof threw himself down, clawing at the man's collar, but the oar bent, cracked, and splintered. With the despairing cry, Dervis let go and grabbed hold of the outflung hand. The weight on him was appalling. Elof braced his feet against the oar mounting to avoid being dragged in himself. Dervis gasped in agony. The veins on his brow stood out as if he was on the rack. The mounting snapped then, and Elof slid forward. Dervis sank chest deep and dragged him out over the black water. But Elof's free hand still held Gorthar, and he speared it downward once. Twice. It struck. The water convulsed and darkened, and Dervis was suddenly lighter, sagging in the water. Tenvar and Arvis reached then and helped Elof haul him in. But as his leg came over the edge of the log, they cried out in horror, for the flesh had been stripped from it, and the leg bones laid bare. Hills, shuddering, whipped off Dervis's heavy belt to loop it around the thigh and stem the spurting blood, but hesitated, let it fall, and shook her head. Dervis was a limp weight in their hands, and the spurting had stopped. Then she cried out and flung herself forward to the raft's edge. The patterned blade of her axe hewed downward, Elof felt its impact in the sodden wood and saw a ghastly thing leap like a landed fish and go slithering severed across the logs in a spray of dark liquid. A broad frond of waterweed it might have been, save that thick ridged fingers writhed within the brownish web, tipped each with a short claw, and the dappled coat of it was sleek fur. He had but a moment to see it, then the whole raft heaved, as if on some invisible wave it could not crest. It listed, tilted, sloping ever more steeply. They'll slide us off! And overturn the raft on us! cried Ells. Spring clear while you still may! None lingered to argue. 
He loft sheathed his sword, braced his feet against the slanting logs, and kicked out with all his strength. Sky and shore whirled about him. Then icy blackness lashed his face. Just behind him, a great bulk like a breaching whale slapped at the water, and a wave engulfed him. Struggling, he sank, fighting for breath and imagining every instant the clutch of webbed claws about his limbs. The weight of his pack pulled him down, but never for a moment did he think of casting it free. He bumped something solid, slimy, old, and threshed in panic a moment before he realized it must be the lake bottom. He pulled his feet under him and kicked upward. Almost at once his head bobbed free. He could tread water and cough up all he had been swallowing, suck in a painful, blessed breath. Then he had time to be surprised. He must be in the shallows already. There indeed were the dark walls of the shore, not far off, and other heads bobbing across the silvery water, too far to aid or to be aided. He kicked out to follow them, but it swum hardly a stroke when the water boiled before him and a rounded shape broke surface. It was an eye, an eye the width of his whole face, and it fixed him as it rose. It was set high like a frog's in a socket above a huge rounded head, and the look of it was glassy, impersonal, utterly unhuman, yet acutely aware. That same dappled fur clad the head, sleek and seal-like. Water spilled from the smooth dome as it arose, running in streams over strands of weed that hung like mocking garlands about the head and straggled down past the corners of the wide, lipless mouth, fixed in a false, sated smile. There was no chin, no neck. The lower jaw curved downward to massive shoulders and a great ton of a body. Desperately, Elof groped for his sword, fearing it had fallen from its scabbard. But the cold hilt came to hand. He drew, but hesitated. If this thing had a mind... He held the blade up for it to see, a shadow upon the water, and motioned it aside. The creature answered clearly enough. Its mouth gaped, a ghastly grin that bared rows of long teeth and it glided slowly, tauntingly away, forward. Elof thought of Dervis and shivered. The intensity of purpose in those eyes was more frightening than any rage or hatred. Then, anger colder than the lake welled up in him, and he struck out between the glinting eyes. The blade bit and bounced free. The water convulsed and boiled up darkness. Elof gulped air and jackknifed down. He felt a huge body surge overhead where he had been. He slashed at it, but the water slowed his stroke. The shadowy bulk stooped upon him. He twisted about and thrust upward with all his strength. The blade bit deep and a violent threshing hurled him this way and that in the water, till his chest labored and his head grew tight and dizzy with pain. At last, he managed to twist the blade free and find the air once again. But even as he drew breath, his knees scraped painfully into gravel. The sword chinked against a rock. He stood, found himself scarcely chest deep, and floundered on, fumbling with vague anxiety at his pack. Still there, still closed, he could feel no more. The water fell away from him, leaving his body a dead weight, his wet clothes leaden. When the last wavelet lapped his ankle, a sudden agony lanced through him. Deadly fear for ills, for Morvan, the others. 
but he could bear the weight no longer. He dropped where he stood. He strove to raise himself, found himself staring into dense undergrowth above the bank. In among it, eyes stared back at him. Eyes unlike the lake creatures, or any other he had seen. Eyes just as Rock had described them so many leagues past. Narrow, slanting gleams of yellow. Unwinking. Impassive. He struggled to lift the sword he still grasped. But the instant it scraped upon the gravel, the eyes blinked out, vanishing utterly. He stared a moment, then slumped down upon the pebbles. Darkness took him. Hard fingers clutched him, and in panic he snapped awake, flailing wildly around. Hold hard there, said a protesting voice in his ear, and to his equally wild relief, it was Ills. He grabbed and hugged her hard, and felt her sturdy shoulders quiver in his embrace. But she snorted impatiently and brushed him off. Napping quietly on the shore, just like you, when we were combing the place. And close to giving you up, grumbled Rock's voice. Fond of making life awkward, aren't you? Why'd you head so far out? Elof sighed and sat up, blinking through gummy eyes. The night was past, the gray dawn lightening up the trees. And he was looking out across the bay water, so still and black and heavy, it might have been an oil pool. Only a faint swell upheaved its smooth surface, like the flank of some slow-breathing beast, giving no hint of what had lately happened there and what it yet lurked beneath. He saw that he was on the outermost tip of the headland. He must have, he must almost have been dragged out into deep water. Then you were not... A set? Any of you? Ills caught his arm. No. Were you? You took no hurt? None, I think. Save bruises and near drowning. Was I the only one? Are Kermorvan and all the rest safe? Rock nodded somberly. Aye, he's ashore and gathering the others. We saw a fair number, and maybe the rest are just late sleepers like yourself. Come, if you can walk, we'll go and see. Elof nodded silently, willing his stiffened limbs to move. His first attempt to stand brought on a tearing attack of cramp. But when that subsided, he was able to limp along the stony shore to the wider middle of the beach. It was a bedraggled, dejected group of figures that sprawled there, but they sprang up swiftly and gladly enough when they saw him. Are we all escaped then? he asked anxiously, when the excitement had subsided. Save Dervis, that is, and the other who fell? That was Eisden, said Kermorvan harshly. Elof was shocked. He had never seen the warrior so haggard, his lips drawn and bloodless. I had his hand, even as the logs took him. One instant more, and... Guys shook his head grimly. No blame to you. You did what you could. Well, that you did not follow. I said Rock. Rest of us clinging onto that hank of firewood by our fingertips. And he somehow gets it ashore on a sandbank so close to shore, we can all but walk. Seems shallows don't suit those brutes. Did what he could, and still blames himself. Never mind saving all our skins. Did he so? demanded Cassie sardonically as ever though his face was gray, as if he labored under some great terror. Did he indeed? All? 
Stan? demanded Borhee. Where's he got to? We forgot Stan. As one, they turned to look out across the little bay, scanning water and shoreline for the least trace of another human form. Borhee cupped his hands to shout, but Kermorvan cocked his head at the looming palisade of trees above them. Wait. I've not told you this before, but it is meat you know now. We have had watchers, whom I guess we have evaded in crossing the lake. Best we do not draw them to us again. And swiftly he told them the little he knew of the children of Tapayao. We must search indeed, he concluded, but swiftly, and above all, silently. Like morning shadows, they slipped along the shoreline, questing even beyond the bay for some trace of their companion. Once Elof espied something far off across the waters, but it was only the second raft, overturned but whole, lodged on some remote sandbank. Its wet logs glistened as empty as all the waters between. Softly they lapped at the pebbles by the searcher's feet, but no trace of the lost corsair did they yield. At last, Kermorvan had to call a halt to the futile search. Aye, why not? muttered Cassie to Arvis. It's just another poor Southern. I've gone. Just you, me, and Borhe left. It's clear who's borne the brunt of this little jaunt. Then he sprawled flat on the stones, clutching his mouth. Guy standing over him with his great fists clenched and his dark face purple with rage. And Eisden? demanded the forester in stolid outrage. And the lad Holvar? Then I'll add one southern more to the tally any time you say, Cassie. Cassie, face contorted, scrambled up clutching a jagged rock, only to have Borhe snatch it from him so that he fell down again. Enough! barked Kermorvan, pushing Guy's back. You, Cassie, you brought that upon yourself. Aye, said Borhe, ignoring Cassie's glare and making no move to help him up. Save your bile for them things as did the killing, eh? Murdering brutes to attack for no cause. Elof shook his head unhappily. Not so, Borhe. I was there, damn, we, we shattered. Their fish trap, I guess, by the net. It must have cost them much labor, or since they cannot come on land, they must have worked only with driftwood. They may have thought we were attacking them. And as to slain? Ills maimed one. I wounded or slew another. We could not talk with them. That was the pity. Silence fell and many looked out at the lake once again. From oil to steel it turned as warmer light spread up the sky behind the wooded hills, and from steel to gold as the sun itself rose. Soft wisps of mist drifted over the waters, as if to flirt with its mirrored clouds. Small birds began to chirrup and twitter in the bushes around them, and the horrors of the night hung less heavy about them. But Cassie sat apart on a stone and spat blood through puffy lips. Well, demanded Ills, who had no great love of sunrise. What now? Kermorvan held up an urgent hand for quiet and gestured to the forest. Elof heard it then, a distant echo along the lake, the trample of many hooves, harsh snorting breaths a crackle of large bodies moving through the brush. A herd of some kind, he said, with the ring reborn in his voice. Nothing alarms them, so we have evaded the watchers for now. But if we wish to stay free, we cannot linger here, and we must hunt to stay alive. So, he shrugged, 
You asked what now, my lady? We press on. What else can we do? So it is told that as the rising sun shot the mists with pale gold, the company passed at last beneath the eaves of the great forest, Tapaiola on Aithan itself. And since the river had borne them nigh on a hundred and fifty leagues from its western margins, they stepped at once into the very heartlands of that domain. To Elof, weary and grieving, it was a stranger experience than he had expected. He felt as if he had entered some immense hall of worship, some mighty tomb or mausoleum, such as he had seen in Kerbrahein the city, but infinitely vaster, infinitely more imbued with ancient presence. Towering trees upheld it as pillars, sustaining an immense vault work of interwoven boughs a roof whose greens and yellows shone far richer than copper domes or tiles of gold. Even the sun must defer before them, bowing down in narrow beams to pick small patches of the forest floor out of its reverential gloom, or scattering into glimmering green shades upon the many-textured trunks. Rainbow iridescence it awoke, like the shadows of stained glass, from the water droplets that glistened on every leaf and moss patch, in every crevice of the trunks, that hung heavy in the unstirring air. For this was a place of water, a forest of rains, ever remembering the last shower or looking forward to the next. Now Elof was on land, he could see how much the lesser trees had changed, as well as the greater. Among the more familiar dogwoods, junipers, tall hollies, and black cherries, he found slender, quaking aspens, sumacs, spreading mulberries already heavy with their unripe fruit, and a hundred others he hardly knew. Willows and adders arched over the little streams they passed, but between them lifted madder and red osier, shrubs in his homeland grown here to trees. Indeed, tree and shrub, evergreen and seasonal alike, even the creepers that draped them like rigging on high masts, all were grown more tall, more rich than any he had ever seen, so that it felt to him as if it was he and his fellows who had dwindled and were become like little beasts that dodged and scuttled through their brief lives among the roots. And it was not only the imposing trees that diminished humanity, but something greater that dwelt in this place, that ancient presence he had felt from the first. I keep thinking there's somebody or else around, muttered Rock, who was walking by Elof's side. Not spying on us, more like, it's hard to say, like there was someone in the next room or round the, round the corner, and you always knowing it, someone important. Elof nodded. I felt the same, but more acutely, as if I walked stealthily past that someone's door or behind his back. A little excited, a little afraid, as when I was a child and sought to avoid my master or mistress. He shook his head, puzzled and daunted. In Vade's tower on that first dark night, he had sensed something of the kind, but more remote, a vast emptiness of anguish remembered. This was different, the thrill of it, the nervous, ting tickling tingle, was so strong to recall the touch of the ice, to him agony, to Kermorvan only chill and unease. Here Rock and the others felt no more, and unease was natural enough. Well, we, Elof sighed, 
We have worse problems for now. But if you ever begin to feel we are about to turn that corner, or that someone's uh, about to turn around, agreed Rock, I, I'll tip you the word, and you me. If the river was that bad, I reckon we've got to be ready for most anything here. But that first day, as the travelers cast about for the track of the herd, they saw nothing save the small life of any ordinary forest, though even those creatures were larger and sleeker than they had seen before. The very jays that swooped chittering and scolding were larger, blazing arrows of color among the heavy foliage. How can they fly so fast in this air? panted Tenvar, pushing back his uh, streaming hair. His clothes, like everyone else's, had obstinately refused to dry out entirely. It's like soup! Cormorvan smiled, though his own hair hung lank and grayed with dew. Would it were as sustaining? But it is rich in other ways. Sense linger even for feeble human noses. I am sure we draw near the track of some large beasts, large enough to yield us food for many a long league more. So do not grudge the effort, Tenvar, and may a full belly be the least of your rewards. But though the other hunters felt as Kermorvan did, they still had not picked up the trail by the time the light began to fail. There was nothing to be done save camp and await the dawn. Cassie, most skillful with snares, caught them two rabbits, and this with roots and herbs gathered by Elof, who knew most about them from his sojourn in the marshlands, was all they had to sustain them that day. They found a dell, little more than a patch of earth among great tree roots, that was drier than the rest. And there Kermorvan made an earth oven, covering it with leaves to damp down the smoke. But though it worked well, and the rabbits were unusually large, they made a small meal for ten weary travelers. Made sure it was three I saw you take up, Huntsman for he remarked cheerfully as he gnawed the last fragments of a bone. Not hiding one all for yourself, are you? Cassie curled his lip. Two's what I caught. Two's what we've had. If you want any more, go out, get out and take them yourself. I give you leave. Quiet, the pair of you, grunted Arvis, normally the most patient of men. Do you save your energy for the hunt? Then you'll be able to feed your faces all the better. Me? My back pains me. My legs are leaden. My heart's sore. And I'd swear I'm catching an og from these wet clothes. Care only for sleep. So say we all, said Kermorvan Riley. This is as dry a place as we shall find and I think as safe. Rest you while you may. The first watch is mine. Elof rolled himself in his cloak, clammy as it was, and pillowed wet hair on damp arm. He was so weary that despite the chill, he slept almost at once. But it was an unquiet sleep, full of strange dreams of the solitary redwood in its lawn of flowers, of the great gusty voice that called from afar. And eyes moved through his dreams, eyes with a snake-like glitter, eyes pallid and staring, narrow, slanted, yellow. He awoke, shivering violently in the dark, looked around for reassurance as a dreamer may who opens his eyes from inner turmoil. At least they had a sentinel. But where was he? Nobody sat up. Kermorvan was curled up not far away, 
his lean features just recognizable in the faint glimmer of starlight that penetrated the canopy. Angrily, Elof reached out and shook him. Fine watcher you are, he hissed, and jumped as Kermorvan uncoiled like a snake. In the blink of an eye, he was squatting by Elof's shoulder, peering about. But I am not the watcher, he murmured. It is past the middle hour, and I bade Cassie take my place. Where might he be, I wonder? A branch rustled, feet scuffed in the mold. They both sprang up. A stocky shadow moved out from behind a tree. Kermorvan sighed and slid his half-drawn blade back into the scabbard. Where have you been? He demanded in an angry whisper. Where do you think? grunted Cassie ungraciously and settled down to his watch once more. The others looked at one another and shrugged. Elof was just settling down under his cloak when he saw Kermorvan stop, whirl about, and jerk Cassie to his feet by the front of his heavy jacket. You! Where were you indeed, watcher? hissed Kermorvan. The fury in his voice startled Elof. And what has become of Borhe while well, you were gone? Elof looked across the circle of sleepers, and with a sudden thrill of alarm, he too noticed the empty place. How did I know? gurgled Cassie, feet almost leaving the ground in the force of Kermorvan's grasp. He threw back his arms in protest. Not my fault if he wanders! Elof saw the faint glimmer, flung himself forward on all fours, and wrenched at the hand as it swept inward towards Kermorvan's side. Even a hunter's wiry strength could not match the grasp of a smith. Elof caught what fell, and held the knife up for Kermorvan to see. The warrior nodded. His face took on a look Elof knew, remote and hard as a stone carving. You will take me to Borhe, he said very softly, and Cassie began to struggle wildly in their grip. I don't know, he gasped and stopped, for Elof seized him by the hair and twisted his head round. Then why the blade? I counsel you, huntsman, answer. Lord Kermorvan is noble and just. He would not carve strips off you with your own traitor's weapon. But me? I am of no birth. And I am not so damned sure. He held the knife before Cassie's eyes. Speak. Where's Borhe? Alive or dead? Alive! choked Cassie. Half strangled. But danger! Kermorvan hurled him back hard against the tree trunk. Then all the more reason you take us to him now. He swept out his sword. Obey. The struggle, though in whispers, had aroused the remainder of the company by now. But Elof bade them stay where they were and keep watch and, as an afterthought, to kindle fire in the oven and prepare torches. A good thought, whispered Kermorvan, as they marched Cassie out before them into the darkness of the wood. Though I would risk it only if peril is already upon us. How far, Cassie? It was less than five hundred strides he led them, though many times he claimed to be lost but the point at his back was a powerful lodestone. And at last, coming around the trunk of a great storm-blasted laurel oak, they found Borhe. In the finding, though, they stood for a moment, stunned. He stood against the trunk, or rather hung, for his arms were lashed loosely round the bowl, 
and his chin propped up on two crossed corals dug into it. A flood of dark liquid glistened on his head, and no better light than the star gleam was needed to know it for blood. The smell was enough. Elof feared him already dead, but suddenly he jerked upright in his ropes and began to struggle and whimper. It's not his blood. Behind him, on the broad, ridged bark, hung the mangled corpse of a rabbit, pinned there like... Elof bit his lip, like some kind of offering. And what did that make for he? He drew Gorthar, then hesitated, startled, as Cassie began to shout, No, leave him! You must! It's dangerous! Deadly! You don't understand! Deadly danger! Leave him! Let him bide! I can't stop it! Elof turned away contemptuously. The black blade flicked out once, twice, and Borhe slumped forward, moaning with relief. Then shock clawed at Elof's heart. Harris! choked Kermorvan, his clear voice gone hoarse and hollow. The howl that cascaded down the air shivered their thoughts as a stone, a sheet of glass. So powerful was it that it awoke a single sight in both their minds, a sudden glimpse of long, reeking jaws agape against the moon. Ravening hunger, fiendish menace, echoed in that wailing cry, the voice of no man or beast they knew. But it was not far off. Cassie was shrieking now, fit to wake the whole wood. Don't you understand? Don't you understand? There had to be one. They had to have one. I can't call it back. Kermorvan hooked a powerful arm round the huntsman's neck and struggled to silence him. Well, Elof heaved Borhe to his feet. Can he walk? barked Kermorvan, clamping Cassie's jaws shut. Then back to the camp. Be still, fool, he hissed, as Cassie whimpered and struggled and renewed his struggle. If there is any safety for you now, it must be with us. They turned and ran for the dell. Cassie a limp foot dragging bundle in Kermorvan's grasp. For he, an arm round Elof's shoulder, plucked off the leather rag that had gagged him, unleashing a flood of terrified babbling. He, bastard, told me, show me what he'd done with the other rabbit. Good use, show hunter's lore worked, belted me, strung me up. Ah, Scythana, come to us. What's that? The howl shimmered among the trees again, this time nearer still, and again from off to the side. The hunt! screamed Cassie, and abruptly became a frenzied flurry of limbs. Tremorvan stumbled, his grip loosened, and Cassie was off, bounding like a fright-maddened deer over root and through brush. Let him go, gasped Elof. Help, Borhe! Together they scooped him up, sprang for the dell, and tumbled gasping into the hands of their friends. With a howl like the storm wind, something went crashing through the undergrowth behind them. Something large, and behind it others. Their stride a bounding, loping sound like dog or wolf. But longer wider, and all who heard thought that they were not on four legs, but on two. Past they streamed, while those terrible howls pierced the travelers' hearts. And then it seemed that the last of them turned aside and came padding, more slowly, in their direction. 
the fire, gasped Kermorban. Light torches, all. Stay well within the firelight. Then, in the shadows beyond it, another and most fearful howl shocked the travelers rigid as rabbits before a weasel. Someone kicked aside the leaves. The fire pit blazed up in yellow light, in yellow flame, as the torches were thrust in, and the clear glare scoured the darkness from the dell. At its margins, slivers of another light awoke, and Rock and Elof shuddered to see again the pale foxfire gleams that had so startled them among the undergrowth. Only now, they floated in the darkness higher than a man's head. They were not alone. Other pairs of eyes appeared, moving this way and that to the sound of soft feet padding, pacing like fell beasts encaged. Ills moved close to Elaw, and he heard the tremor in her breath. She seized his free hand, and he squeezed hers hard. Defiantly, Kermorvan stretched out his sword. A low growl answered, and such was its menace that the travelers all shrank together. But the eyes came no nearer, pacing back and forth, back and forth, just beyond the reach of the light. For a long hour it lasted, till Elof thought his nerve could stand no more. It did not help to hear the trembling chatter of Borhe's teeth. But then, abruptly, it ended. From far off to the north of the silent forest came a rending scream. A human scream. And then another. Louder even than the single triumphant howl that blended with it. The eyes swung away as one, northward. On it went, a frenzied, mind-cloven shrieking that rose to a single, long, thin note and then died away to nothing. Feet crashed in the bushes. A sudden gust of wind pressed down fire and torches. Shadows rushed in. But Kermorvan dashed forward, swinging his torch, and hurled it out high into the dark. Like a blazing star stone it fell, and in that brief streak of light, they caught one glimpse of a hunched shadow higher than a man. Yellow fangs foam-flecked in a narrow muzzle, a long flank pelted in black, wiry, and close-curled. Then the loping feet passed swiftly northward and were gone. Kermorvan let out a long, shaky breath. They could have run any man down in moments. All this time, they must have been toying with him. Till dawn, said Ills tremulously. Raise the powers, it nears. And Elof too saw the faint promise of light in the sky, and drew breath more easily. Well, Borhe, he sighed, it seems he has himself paid dear for the bad turn he meant you. But Borhe, huddled against a root, seemed scarcely to hear. He shivered and knitted his fingers. An offering, he said. They'd have it to set foot in the woods. Or him instead. His bargain with them. Their price for a good hunt. Like the rabbit. Clear trail and a sure kill. And they saw that hanging around his neck two more of the black steel-headed corals from Cassie's arbalist. The heavy bow itself lay on the ground where its owner had laid it. After only a moment's hesitation, Kermorvan picked it up. 
I wonder what manner of blessing was laid upon this. But we cannot lightly abandon a good hunting weapon. Tenvar, Ur, do you help Borhi? He must recover as best he can afoot. Our need bids us be gone, ere we starve. They moved out into the growing light, and a forest that seemed a different place, the least likely shelter for the horrors of the dark. But they were not yet quit of them. Guys, the most practiced hunter left them, claimed to find some promising sense on the breeze, so they followed it westward. A little way on a towering fir rose before them, and when Guise and Elof rounded its great bowl, they beheld a thick spattering of blood, still fresh in the mold. They looked up, sprang back with the shock. Elof gestured frantically to keep Borhi away, but it was too late. He also had seen, and stood staring, his face as dusty gray as the bark. There, propped high beyond reach among the upper branches, hung the body of Cassie. Of his clothes, of his flesh, rags alike remained like a pitiful carcass worried by a scavenger pack. Yet one arm, more whole than the other, was laid across a bough, stiffly outthrust in the direction of a trail that opened out eastward before them, sloping uphill among the trees. Kermorvan inclined his head grimly, his gray-green eyes cold as the sea they resembled. So... Justice of a sort is done, it would seem. Elof looked at Borhi and shook his head. Justice? he remarked. Say rather, an offering is accepted, even if it was not the one intended. Kermorvan looked at him sharply. You may be right. In any event... There is no more we can do for him, not even bury him. And that trail leads eastward, which is our road in any event. So, let us press on at once. Aye, said Borhi quietly, that's best. And from that moment, he seemed to recover his wits. It was his good cheer that never quite came back. Their scant meal of the night before had only served to sharpen hunger. And for all their hurts and aches, and the persistent dampness of their clothes, they moved swiftly and eagerly up the shadowy trail. It was a strange hunt, for they followed no spore. Only that macabre signpost, and what guys read in the breeze, gave them any, re any assurance. But ere long, Kermorvan too caught the scent, and wrinkled his narrow nostrils. Not an unclean smell, but strong. I guess we follow a herd, but of what? That is another matter. Perhaps guys may. He stopped. Guys, padding along the trail just ahead, had ducked hastily behind the bowl of a stout red oak. Now he was gesticulating furiously to the others, beckoning them on yet waving them to stay down. At quiet, they crept forward, taking every pain to avoid the least rustle or crackle. The last few paces they all but crawled and crouched down behind the thickest bushes, quietening even their breath. Now the musky, earthy reek of the mysterious herd was in all their nostrils, and none would dare be first to alarm the creatures. 
The breeze had freshened, as if the trees grew thinner. Strange sounds it carried, the thudding of heavy hooves upon the earth, the creak and snap of boughs. And underneath them all, now and then, a soft, rumbling snort, deep enough to come from the very stone underfoot. Very cautiously, they peered over the leaves. But it was as well the breeze was in their faces, for despite their care, they could hardly help but gasp at what they saw. What are they? whispered Arvis in awe, almost too loud. Dear idiot, snarled Ills under her breath, clutching at her axe. Scare them, and I'll butcher you instead. But such dear, breathed Elof, and even Kermorvan nodded agreement, his eyes alight with the wonder of the sight. This far up the slope, the trees did indeed seem thinner. The summer morning sent a torrent of light between the trunks, and it spilled down hazy and golden upon a host of high antlers. There... Basking among a drone of dancing flies was the herd they sought, and it was vast. In shape, they were not unlike the red-coated deer of the western lands, but, like all else in Ithan, grown regal and immense. Their bodies had the bulk and majesty of the great bulls Elof had once herded, but they stood far taller higher at the shoulder than a tall man could reach. Broader and heavier than a bull's were those shoulders and the neck they bore, and small wonder when such antlers crowned the, lone, the long head. They did not rise in narrow branchings, as in lesser deer, but swept out to either side in a vast flattened spread, upturned at each end like fantastic, many-fingered hands. Their coats were shaggier and lighter than western deer, a dusty, dappled bay that was hard to make out among the denser clump of trees. There were perhaps forty or fifty of these giants in the herd. Chiefly does that browsed in little groups. Chiefly does that browsed in little group. Many had fawns by them, leggy and light-spotted. The immense stags circled the outskirts of the herd, browsing among the coarser undergrowth. One stayed to pull at some bushes near them, and Elof's mouth grew dry with awe. A crown in truth, he thought those regal antlers, for one branch alone could span almost his height. They've got that feeling again, growled Rock softly as they sank back behind cover. As if it's myself that's shrunk. Guys nodded calmly and flexed his bow to be sure of the string's tension in the wet air. How may we dare attack such monsters? muttered Arvis, swallowing with difficulty. One kick from those hooves would shatter a man. One sweep of the antlers fell us all. Yet we must, whispered Kermorvan bleakly, tugging at the arbalist's thick cord and working the cocking lever, his face pitiless as the hunger and care behind. There is more to be seen out there than deer. Look up past the treetops. Elof followed his glance and stiffened with surprise. The branches stood out against the clear blue of summer, but over them loomed a vaster bulk, gleaming white in the brilliance like cloud castles made solid. With sinking heart, he realized that their eastward way had led them to a range of mountains, jagged and high, capped with snow even under that blazing sun. 
they seemed impossibly sudden and close, as if they had only this minute sprung out of the earth as a new and daunting barrier. Thus it was that Elof first looked upon the Menith Ithan, the forest mountains, the backbone of that vast realm and guardian of its most cherished secrets. We would have seen them from far down river, had we not had the forest over us, rasped Kermorvan. To north and south they spread, as far as I make out. There will be no going around them, I am sure. We must find a pass and cross. He looked around at them all. You understand, then. There may be scant game up there, or none at all. We need to find and prepare as much food now as we can. This nearest stag... He said no more, but dropped a quarrel swiftly into the bow. Guys knocked an arrow, and together they slithered silently into the last wall of bushes, slowly and in no rhythm. More hesitantly, the others moved after them, crouched on tense legs, ready for a rush. They froze as they heard a sudden angry snort, and saw antlers toss above the leaves. But the great deer was only striking at a persistent fly, and the antlers rose and fell gently once again as it returned to cropping the bushes. Elof's heart sank as he saw Kermorvan rising on one knee, taking careful aim. The quarrel seemed minute, hardly more than a fly sting to that bulk of muscle. He would as soon have attacked thus the monstrous mammoth they had encountered in Ithenic. As Kermorvan's finger curled on the trigger, there came a sudden screeching cry, and from among the branches behind them a winged flash of red arrowed upward, crying alarm and havoc. The antlers jerked upward, the pendulous muzzle tossed back in a cloud of steaming breath. The huge nostrils flared rigid, and the stag gave a loud, blaring cry that was at once challenge and warning. The other stags trumpeted to the echo. The does stared, ears twitching, and bounded to herd in the fawns, who jumped and stumbled on overlong legs. Guys and Kermorvan sprang up to shoot, but it was too late. All at once, the giant herd was surging about the clearing, hooves churning in the damp soil, bunching and milling together in a tight ring. Elof turned to glare at whoever had alarmed the bird, and so saw the true cause. He had barely a moment to shout a warning and spring aside, the others spilling after him. A deep, coughing growl sounded. Or he tried to spring up, but Elof and Tenvar held him down. Kermorvan caught Geiz's arm and they dived headlong among the bushes, barely in time. Then through the brush there burst three brindled beasts as big as ponies, and more bulky, bounding heavily on their thick legs. Their flat heads were held low, the wide jaws agape their long fangs outthrust like assassin's daggers. Claws sprang out on the wide paws. They spared the travelers no glance, but sprang into the clearing and, crouching low, circled about the herd to pen them in. The stags bellowed deafeningly and struck out with hoof and antler, but the attackers moved too fast. The does panicked, and the herd became a milling stampede. One tall stag, a fraction slower than its fellows, passed the wrong side of a tree and was thrust out from the threshing cordon of hooves. Then the killers struck. It was a clean, 
expert kill. Almost graceful, save its deadly end. One daggertooth sprang at a kicking rear leg, dragging the stag to a halt. Another leaped for the muzzle and hung there by the wide lip, dragging the head down and hindering the deadly sweep of the antlers. Then the third lunged up at the lowered neck, twisting in midair to embrace the throat in its long forelegs, hung there and bit. Deep into the thick mane sank the long fangs, stabbing down into the great veins, and the jaws clamped shut about the windpipe. Blood fountained among the sandy fur, the stag struggled and threshed and gave great snoring moans. But the killers clung, scrabbling upward with huge hind claws at belly and flanks the antler could the antlers could no longer defend. Their sheer weight held it in place while it stifled in the iron grip. Its long head threshed back once in anguish. Then the pillar legs bent and folded. The great beast sank forward, kneeling, and toppled sideways with a crash. The killers rolled aside between the quivering legs and fell on the spilling belly, ripping at it with muffled snarls of satisfaction. The herd, relieved of its pursuers, wheeled about and went streaming off into the distant trees, and the thunder of its passage drummed long in the earth. Now, shouted Kermorvan suddenly, dropping the bow. Now, if ever. And leaping to his feet, he tucked his cloak over his arm, so that it flared out around him, drew sword, and went charging out into the clearing. He's gone clean daft, cried Rock, horrified. No, shouted Guise and Elof together, understanding Kermorvan's purpose. No, after him, and make all the noise you may. Elof sprang forward, crashing through the bushes with a wild yell. And after him, Ills with the same exultant shout that had greeted the Master Smith's downfall. In their wake streamed the company, shrieking and yelling and brandishing weapons. But Kermorvan was far ahead of them, already at the kill. The dagger teeth turned, dripping jaws a snarl, and cuffed at him with paws as large as his head. But their very size made them slow, and he slid between them like quicksilver, slashing at the outstretched claws. Growling and spitting, they fell back from the sweeping blade but one leaped up on the carcass and poised to spring. Elof grabbed for his hammer, but even as its front feet lifted, there came a snap, a hum, and it tumbled kicking among the trampled weeds. Guys, brandishing his bow, cheered hoarsely and ch charged forward with the rest. It was too much for the other killers. Their nerve broke, and they slunk back, roaring and snarling to cover their retreat. Right to the clearing's edge, they snarled and struck at their tormentors. But once within the tree's shadow, they whirled about and went crashing away through the brush. The company fell upon the stag almost as ravenously as the dagger teeth, but Kermorvan himself leaned on his sword a moment to catch his breath. Ill stopped and passed him her water flask. I've seen you do brave things enough, long man. But was not taking on three of those brutes the prime of both? Not so, gasped Gormorvan. Common enough in the wild that scavengers drive a killer from his kill. Wolf packs often do it to dagger teeth, so why not we? It seldom comes to a fight and I feared famine among the mountains far worse. He smiled thinly. Well, 
Scavengers let us be. The dagger teeth may yet return. We must butcher the poor brute swiftly and bear off all we can carry to some safer spot. Swiftly they stripped the flesh from the great deer, cutting it into pieces of a size they could carry. Fumbles and bones we leave to the dagger teeth if they return, said Kermorvan Riley. They prefer those anyway. Their dead fellow also. Meat eaters make poor flesh themselves. But guys took the fangs for a trophy. They left that clearing and climbed on through the wooded hills till the near edge of night. The ground grew drier as it rose, though cut and crossed by many small streams and rivulets. At every ridge they came to, the mountain tops seemed to loom nearer. But as the warm summer twilight closed in about them, they found a sheltered spot to camp, and could at least at last cook and eat their fill. They sank down then where they sat and slept, but Kermorvan did not fail to set a watch. For two days more he bade them rest, gathering their strength and making ready their great store of meat for the journey ahead. Much of the venison they dried and smoked in thin strips, but Rock found a hollow tree trunk full of honeycomb, and the rest they cooked, chopped, and mixed with, the, with this, berries and wild herbs that Elof and Burr gathered, to make a long-lasting reserve of food. Those days were to Elof an endless time of peace. Strange not to be forever in motion, he remarked to Rock as they watched the steaming clay oven at their feet, pursuing and pursued, under and pray, to have leisure to think and dream, dream a life that was beyond this forest. Rock grinned. And that will be, I hope. Will it? Elof stood and stared up into the roof-like tracery of dark branches, hung with glowing leaves. I can scarcely believe it. I feel it as if the past has dwindled, as if my greatest joys and greatest pains alike have faded away into the distance, and there's a barrier between them and me, a barrier of trees, always trees. Ah, it's not that bad, muttered Rock uneasily. You dream too much, that's all. Work under your hands, that's your need. Come, tend the oven, though it's a poor substitute for forge and furnace. But the sense of isolation only grew in Elof. The times of his youth and his first meeting with Kara... He could summon up as glimpses through shifting foliage, one minute bright and dazzling, the next obscured, faded, and unreachable. He knew that no more than a year and a half had passed since last he saw her, and yet it might have been in another life. With heart, with mind, he reached out to her, but it seemed to him that they were astray, both astray, wandering far apart among darkling trees. He gazed up at the patches of blue sky overhead, seeking, he knew not why, a sweep of wings. But the trees stooped and whispered, hid the sky from his sight, and showed to him no more than the mountaintops that he must soon cross. The morrow's dawn came very clear and bright, for the clouds did not hang so heavy over the hill forests as below at this season. It seemed to them all a good omen, bidding them rise early and make good speed. Even that small time of rest had made a great difference to them. Food had hardened failing thews, 
filled out hollow cheeks. New hurts had healed. Old scars grown less stiff beneath clothes that had, at, la at, lo at last, lost their clammy dampness. Rock even began to whistle, as Elof remembered him doing on their boyhood journeys with the Master Smith. And though Kermorvan cast a wary eye at the trees, he did not rebuke him. High reared the mountains before them, and in that day they passed out of the hills and in among their lower slopes. Yet their path never took the company quite out of the shadow of the woods, for the trees grew thick over all the land that was easiest to pass, and the forest was always with them.